Good afternoon and welcome. We are waiting a few minutes while people connect to begin this webinar, Hearts. We're just waiting for all participants to be able to connect to this webinar, Hearts in the Americas. Welcome, please settle down. We will be beginning in a few moments. Welcome to those who have just logged on. Welcome to this monthly webinar, Hearts in the Americas. Greetings to all participants. We are going to just wait a few extra moments for all participants to be able to connect to the webinar. Again, good afternoon and welcome to this HEARTS webinar. We are just briefly waiting for all participants to be connected and we will then begin the webinar. I think everybody's connected now. Let me begin with some instructions as to how to use this uh, Zoom platform today. We suggest you locate a button in the shape of a globe that is in the lower right of your screen that will give you access to interpretation services. This webinar will be interpreted in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. So please select the language of your choice. Once again, it's the globe in the lower portion of your screen. There you will be able to cho choose the language you'd like to listen to. Look now at step number three here. Click the interpretation button and choose the same language to listen and speak. And if necessary, click on mute original audio. We're going to wait a few moments while people select their language. Once again, welcome to all. And I now offer the floor to Dr. Pedro Ordunez, the regional advisor for the Pan American Health Organization. Thank you very much, colleagues, and I'd like to warmly welcome you to this new webinar of the series Hearts in the Americas. Today, July 14, 2021, we have brought you to get to listen to this webinar, Building Bridges Between Societies of Cardiology and Primary healthcare teams. The webinar wants to focus on three major problems. First of all, cardiovascular disease as primary cause of uh, mortality and mobility in this region and throughout the world. And what we'd heard at previous sessions that after decades of sustained decrease in mortality rates, we're now again seeing an uptick in mortality in some countries. And for this reason, we have brought together the, uh, in, we have met with the Inter-American Society of Cardiology that brings together officers and uh, PAHO. And this has just been, a partnership ratified by the governing bodies of PAHO. 
And this brings together the major cardiologists of the region with over 27 countries and 40,000 cardiologists. We, another interesting topic is common interest for the implementation of hearts as the flagship program of WHO and uh, PAHO to manage cardiovascular risk with special emphasis on hypertension and secondary prevention. We have a wonderful program today. And we always begin by remembering the moment we're cur currently living. We're in the midst of a pandemic with a tremendous social, economic, human impacts and consequences. It is known as COVID-19. And many countries in the most recent weeks are fighting intensely because they are faced with a very complicated situation. And that means that you cannot uh, drop your guard at any point in town. So that's a very important issue. And I'd like to remind our colleagues who are at the primary level of care, as well as in the hospitals and our primary health care teams who are working so hard to confront and mitigate the effects of the pandemic. So we have an excellent webinar ahead of us, and it consists of three sections. The first section will have us learning from two successful cases of implementing hearts in the Americas. These two successful cases were Panama and Trinidad and Tobago. In the second section, we will hear from two highly well-known professors in our region, Dr. Patricio Lopez Jaramillo and Dr. Manuel Daniel Piñeiro. I will be introducing them in detail further on. We will also hear from the outgoing president of the Inter-American Society of Cardiology. And in the third section, we will hear from two heart consultants. They are younger and they've been working specifically in two countries. One is Argentina, Andrés Rosende, and the other is Eric Zuniga from Chile. And we will also have comments from Fernando Lanas. So without any further ado, let us kick off this webinar that will be sharing with us good news and valuable resources. Let me begin by introducing the first section. These will allow us to learn from two successful cases of implementing hearts. First, Dr. Elsa Arenas. She is in the non-communicable diseases department of the Ministry of Health of Panama. She has been the leader implementing hearts in Panama. Then we will hear from Dr. Rogers Doon, Rohit Dun of Trinidad and Tobago, the Ministry of Health of that country. And they were the leaders of these two experiences. So let me now offer the floor to Dr. Elsa Arenas. Good day to you all. Non-communicable diseases are the principal cause of death in Panama. Panama. Hypertension is amongst the 10 top causes of death with 961 deaths in 2019. Hypertension is a problem in Panama. So the strategic plan for non-communicable diseases, it is included as a health issue that needs to be addressed integrally. And it is ratified in the national health policies for, of 2016. How is hearts integrated in Panama? Our first conversations with the hearts team in Washington took place in December 2016 and culminated in 2017 when an official from the public ministry, health ministry, was invited to attend a meeting that took place in Chile. When this official returned, we began a demonstration period at the Nuevo Chorillo Health Center. Furthermore, there were coordinations within the health ministry 
to coordinate the health program for adults, the supply and uh, medicines and other supplies and other technological com aspects. At the same time, we kept up our conversations with Washington. In March 2018, through a letter of interest, the Ministry of Health asked the asked PAHO to look into this strategy. We received a response in May that very year when PAHO committed to support us in this initiative. In July 2018, the Social Security joined the initiative. After all, this institution does provide care to about 80% of the Panamanian population. In November, Hearts was the implementation of Hearts in Panama was launched. That year, throughout the country, we created a group of managers and those responsible for each module. A baseline was calculated, was determined through a, with service of a consultancy firm. A plan of action was in, uh, addressed to implement in seven areas. Workshops were organized. We contacted universities. We updated protocols and algorithms and, and provided technical material. We ensured that we had the necessary medicine in supplies and technology, and we conducted clinical and operational training. So between January and March, we were able to train the entire personnel in seven health facilities, and they were trained in the heart strategy. With a change of government in July 2019, we received instructions to scale up the initiative, use it as a tool to address hypertension at all facilities between August and September. We added 20 facilities to the strategy, and in 2020, another 10, which means that today there are 37 facilities that have been fully trained in the strategy. In 2021, we looked at the further scaling up in Panama. We want to work in the 271 primary care centers that are available in the country. The intention is to address 156 facilities between 2021 and 2025 distributed in all the health areas of the country, thus achieving 70% of our facilities to be trained in hearts. This will allow us to have a map looking like this and changing in this manner but in the five years. As an example, we can see what has been planned for this year, for 2021, providing training, five trainings in the regions scheduled for it this year, always thinking about key factors in each facility. Now, how are we going to do this? By seeking support from the highest to the lowest institutional level, achieving interagency agreements between the ministry and social security, having cascade training so that everybody would receive knowledge, sharing all kinds of information with all facilities, whether or not they are implementing HEARTS, working with um, adult care standards that and two very important things, work very actively in having appropriate records in order to achieve, have compliance indicators and regulations for uh, pressure taking equipment in, which need to be validated. What are the challenges we see ahead? Well, obviously, there is a problem of a health system segmentation. We have external agencies that make some decisions about administering drugs, there's overwork, multiplicity of uh, positions and responsibilities. 
public insecurity also that doesn't allow us to go deep into uh, communities, sometimes lack of commitment or motivation by healthcare professionals, a shortage in validated equipment, limited capacity to maintain the equipment, because we do not have standards for their pro or policies for their procurement. And amongst the population, lack of following treatment and obviously the pandemic and all its consequences. And this is obviously going to pose a major problem moving forward. Which have been the lessons learned throughout? First of all, the commitment of the health team and the public policy are fundamental. Support uh, from all level is vital. It is necessary to change the paradigm where we can all say that everyone can help seek hypertense person who are unaware of this situation but are out in the community. And most importantly, without an effective record, it's impossible to move forward. Thank you very much. That was excellent Dr. Elsa Arenas from Panama. That was a great presentation. I'd like to ask the participants today that they make sure that their primary health care teams are properly informed of the existence of HEART, so they participate at events such as today, that they have an opportunity to listen to colleagues and learn from them. Let us move to the second presentation for today. Dr. Rohit Doon in Trinidad and Tobago, he will presenting the progress made by his country implementing HEART. Dr. Rohit Doon, you have the floor to present the progress made in Trinidad and Tobago. Please go ahead. We do apologize, but uh, when we have live webinars, inconveniences occur sometimes and they're beyond our control. But if the presentation can be shown, then we'll be ready. Dr. Rohit Doon, please go ahead from Trinidad and Tobago. We can now see your presentation. The population. The public health care system consists of 104 health centers, primary care health centers, 13 hospitals, and is based on the primary health care model. Now, how about heart scale up in my country? Next slide. Hearts was introduced to us in, in the early 20, in May 2018, and we launched the Hearts. Global Hearts Initiative with Trinidad and Tobago in August 2019. Next slide. Oh, those slides. Where are the slides? Pedro? <laughs> Gloria, yes. August 2019. And we've made a reasonably rapid progress over time. Next slide, please. Um, to where we are today in 20 June, let's say June 2021. In August 2019, we started with five sites, five health centers, 150,000 population. December 2020, we are up to 35 uh, with 300, uh, over 400,000 population. And today, 
We are in 58 sites, primary health care sites in the country, accounting for about 56% of the total, uh, total population. We expect and are on track to be 100%, 104 health centers by December 2022. So there we are, and there we go. Now, what are some of the scale up and strengthening elements of our health centers? health system strengthening elements of our program. Next time. The most important thing that we, we started out with was the development and approval of our treatment algorithm, the evidence-based treatment algorithms, and the protocol for fixed dose combination was introduced at the time. And now we are at a stage where we started with, uh, next slide, please. We started with the, uh, the three three types of protocols. The first protocol was the, is now uh, the, the using the ACE plus the AR and the CCBs and a mixture of ACE and CCBs. The second uh, transition stage for us. Next slide. Uh, we are using both that protocol plus ARBs and CCBs, and we are heading towards by uh, sometime late next year. We use primarily uh, telmisat and, and, and lorapine. So we're moving towards fully compliant with the ARB and CCBs. Next slide, please. Okay, and uh, so access, how will it scale up uh, strengthening health systems? Access to medicines is one such, using the essential medical Medicines protocol recommended by WHO, lisinopril plus amlodipine, transforming itself into telmisatan and amlodipine, which is the third um, block in the, the green portion of that slide. Next slide, please. We'll talk a little bit about um, also our scale up, uh, strengthen the health system. There were six main issues. Building human resource capacity was one. Training and certification of the second cohort of trainers in self-management, strengthening of registries, hypertension treatment algorithm formally approved, introduction of telemedicine for managing some of our patients, and strengthening linkages between primary and secondary healthcare professionals. That was a major part of our health strengthening um, system element of the heart smart use establishment in Trinidad and Tobago. What are some of the challenges? Next slide. Some of the challenges we have encountered over the, over the past year, and particularly in the pandemic year, was access to medicines under the new protocol that we introduced. Sometimes medication stockouts. Other issues were impact of COVID-19 and the heart focal sites and uh, the development of telemedicine, which, was, was, which, which, which has its upsides and downsides. Other uh, challenges encountered was improving the diabetes control uh, as a, a comorbid condition with hypertension, delivery of standardized base evidence treatment protocols, and uh, the introduction of HEARTS, Global HEARTS Initiative and its modules in the private sector, bearing in mind that the HEARTS Initiative in this country has only been introduced into the public health sector. So next year, uh, uh, Mid next year is scheduled to introduce into the public healthcare, a private healthcare system. Another challenge is monitoring and evaluation. And the biggest challenge of all was reduce patient contact with the healthcare system and therefore reduce quality of care. Special challenges we faced in the COVID 19 era limited access to medication and access to healthcare facilities inability to have intensification of medication leading to high levels of therapeutic inertia. No formal public home delivery system for medicine. Lack of widespread home monitoring of BP devices and BP measurements. So access to medicines and technology in the current period of the pandemic was a very severe impediment to, the, to, to spreading the word about hearts and penetrating hearts into all the, the primary healthcare system. And face-to-face -face contact with our patient clearly is an invaluable and irreplaceable uh, way of delivering healthcare services. So what support 
do we think we need from the regional office of the Pan American Health Organization? Well, we have been supported all along very admirably, both from the local office and particularly from the other office led by uh, Pedro and Gloria. We expect that this support to continue. We want to have access to the strategic fund to increase availability and consistent availability and effective uh, of essential medicines for treatment of hypertension. We want to have strengthening of, of, of self-management in the community, particularly using community-based peer groups. We want to strengthen collaboration between the private and public sector. We would like PAHO to play a major role in that. And we, we wish to uh, uh, launch that sort of collaboration in mid next year. And we also want to strengthen new and create new registries and strengthen and create registries, which is a weak point for us. We particularly want to establish registries for heart attack and strokes and training and capacity building to continue, continue. learned. We need to build strong governance structures at all uh, levels, emphasize cap capacity building, strengthen patient self-management, use of evidence-based treatment protocols, ensure mechanisms of consistent supply of essential medication, ensure public, private, civil society collaboration, and develop and continue to develop master trainer cadre, which is of exceptional strategic value. In conclusion, I'd like to add that our experience here in Trinidad and Tobago has led us to believe that the Global Hearts Initiative is a universal good and has the promise and the potential to become one of the most impactful public health interventions of our time. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Dun, por esta... Thank you very much, Dr. Dun, for this incredible presentation that shows the progress made in Trinidad and Tobago. And also, I would like to thank Dr. Arena from Panama. I would like for her to turn on her camera. We have some questions. Dr. Elsa Arena, based on your experience, you know that Central America is behind in the number of countries implementing the HEARTS initiative. As a matter of fact, we currently have Panama and we have some other countries that have been assessing the possibility to become part of this initiative. If you as public health expert with your experience, could you recommend your colleagues in Central America what the main facts are? Why is heart so important? What is heart contributing to this fight against cardiovascular diseases and also non-communicable diseases? Certainly, I can tell you, Dr. Dunez, that the heart strategy for us in Panama has uh, meant a methodological mechanism to be able to address in a comprehensive fashion hypertension. And it is uh, becoming a methodology, a systematic methodology to be able to review and uh, address chronic diseases, which as you know, we have not been able to strengthen this area. We're very good in the area of communicable diseases, and we are having some issues with chronic diseases. Hearts has allowed us to do that. Thank you very much, Dr. Arenas. And the second question I have also for you is, what do you have to say about the participation of heart doctors, of cardiologists? How have you been working with the association of heart cardiologists. Well, cardiologists have been excellent and we immediately address the need with them to establish protocols and algorithms for the care to be provided 
and for the management of hypertension, they all responded favorably. And we gathered in this room where I am today until we were able to have a very high level protocol that was uh, approved by means of a resolution for the whole country. So we have a tremendous number of positive developments with the cardiologist. Thank you very much, Dr. Arenas. And now I am going to give the floor to Dr. Rohit, who is one of our champions in the Caribbean. What do you have to tell your the other countries in the Caribbean? Why is this Hearts Initiative important? What do you have to say about that, Dr. Dunn? Please go ahead. Adelante. Please go ahead. We lost your connection, sir. Tenemos problemas con el audio, correcto? Correct. We are having issues with audio. Tenemos problemas con el audio. Sí, señor. Sí, señor. Bueno, qué pena, qué pena, qué pena, porque estaba interesado en que. It is really a pity because I was really interested in Dr. Rahid Dun, who is the heart's leader in Trinidad and Tobago, who are also. Uh, Iniciativa. Okay, adelante, adelante. A ver, adelante. Please go ahead, sir. Please go ahead. So the fixed dose combinations for management of hypertension, that's that's the, the major um, success factor for us in implementing hearts. Muy bien, muy bien. Muchísimas Very gracias. well. Thank you. I am going to thank Panama and Trinidad and congratulate you also for the progress made and also the example you are setting for the community. And we are now moving on to the second session, but I think that we had an announcement, Gloria, before we do that. Please go ahead. Let us continue with the second. Let us continue with the second section. It seems we're having some audio problems with uh, Gloria, so we are going to move on to the second session. We are going to overcome this situation. In this second session, we have named it how the Inter-American Cardiology Society is supporting the implementation of hearts in the Americas. Let me tell you that the Inter-American Cardiology Society has met recently. It has been a tremendous success with the participation of several countries in this new virtual platform in PAHO and the society and the association, the Inter-American Association had the opportunity to present a panel and given its relevance and also the individuals present, we thought it was important to share with the hearts public. So as part of this second section or session, we are going to have the presentation of someone well known to all of you who is key in addressing cardiovascular disease in the region. And this is Professor Patricio Lopez Jaramillo from the Santander Bucaramanga University in Colombia, who was also our hearts consultant. And Dr. Jaramillo will be telling us why heart technical package is solid. We're not talking about any intervention. We're talking about an evidence-based package. Dr. Jaramillo, please go ahead. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Pedro Ordunez and the Pan-American Health Organization for this kind invitation to have this conference on the technical hearts package. And here we have a series of interventions that are evidence-based. The problem is that still in middle-income countries in Latin America, the main cause of mortality with 42% of the instances is um, accounted for by heart disease and only 23% of heart disease is due 
to the heart problem and 55% of mortality is due to cancer. This difference may be explained through the control factors for heart disease. And in this graph, I am showing you the various attributions to the percentages globally. The first risk element is hypertension. As you can see here, globally, 22.3% of the problems related to heart suffer from heart hypertension. But if we look at the difference between high and middle income countries, such as the ones in Latin America, we see that in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Colombia that participated in this trial, 26.5% of the fraction within the population that has um, heart disease, that disease is attributed to hypertension, whereby in um, high income countries, this number is reduced to 14.2%. And this is certainly reduced to a reduction in the risk factors. And as we have already discussed at this meeting on heart disease, how can we face the heart risk in uh, Latin America. There are three elements that need to be taken into account. Hypertension, tobacco consumption, and dyslipidemia. And we are going to focus on hypertension, which is the main risk factor for death and heart disease in most of the Latin American countries. As you can see, in these results of the studies that we conducted, we included 10,937 hypertensive patients in Latin America, and only 57% was aware of this. 40% of the individuals who suffer from hypertension in Latin America do not know that they suffer from hypertension. And 52.8% received treatment, but only 188 were controlling their disease. And this is something even more complicated. Only a low percentage of the individuals that were receiving treatment, that is to say 18.8%, were under control. And among other causes, one of the problems is related to the management of treatment for hypertension. All of the guidelines recommend the use of combined hypertension therapy, at least two medicines for hypertension. You can see that in this study, only 16.5% of all of the individuals with hypertension were using combined therapy. And this is a great difference among high and middle income countries in low income countries, only 1.6% of the individuals were using this combined um, therapy. Well, only 18.1% of the countries with high income levels were using this medicine. That means that we still need to improve education to be able to use it, to use this combined therapy, this mixed therapy from the outset of the problem, that is to say, with only just one pill. And this has been shown in this very significant trial that was conducted in 23 countries, HOPE 3 trial, that was coordinated from Canada in here in Latin America. It was coordinated from Colombia. We introduced, we included about a 1,000 individuals whose results were published in three articles of these uh, English language magazine or journal. What were the objectives of this uh, HOPE 3 trial in a population, population without cardiovascular disease or moderate risk disease? We assessed the effect of these uh, heart events to diminish the, when we diminish the hypertension with a combination with half the dose. So we diminish also cholesterol with rosuvastatin, 10 milligrams a day. And we also saw the combination of both medicines for hypertension plus statin and 
This should always be implemented with individualized recommendations, giving any changes in the individual. What is it that we consider a moderate risk population? Women that are older than 60, men who are older than 60, we, women older than 60 and women men older than 55 when we have a higher ratio between the waist and hips and also tobacco consumption, HDL, dysglucemia, and also moderate kidney malfunction. We also included, excluded those that had indications or um, any adverse reactions to the medicines in this study. And it is important to indicate that in 84% of the cases, the individuals had at a second risk factor in addition to age, the increased ratio in the measurements of the waist and hips, that is to say, higher abdominal obesity. And what is it that we found? If you look at the administration of mo both medicines plus statin, there was a reduction by 40% of the infarction risk, failure, heart failure, or death due to a cardiovascular event in hypertensive patients. So we had a reaction, a reduction by 40% with the administration of both medicines and in those individuals that had a systolic blood pressure below 240, this was a reduction of 40%. So what are the clinical implications of HOPE-3? The administration of hypertensive therapy combined with fixed doses diminishes the cardiovascular events by 27% in hypertensive patients. That is to say, we're talking about systolic pressure above 140 of moderate risk. So these subjects are the ones that should be receiving this combined therapy for this reduction. Now, the two medicines plus statin lead to a 40% reduction in the number of cardiovascular events. Therefore, based on these results, the various consensus reached in Latin America led us to recall this. The pharmaceutical treatment should be initiated when blood pressure is higher than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury, reaching and maintaining values below 140 over 85. That is to say, preferably around 130 for the systolic pressure, 80 if we are talking about tolerated patients and um, patients that tolerate the medicines and also in diabetic patients. And here we initiate treatment with two hypertensive medicines in two Two medicines in one pill, plus a geric or tyazine like uh, medicine. And these have been the recommendations, and this is indeed what the Heart's Problem program has um, shown. And this is the algorithm that they are proposing. First, there needs to be a screen of all of the adults, and we need to have a measurement of uh, blood pressure especially in individuals older than 35. If you find an individual who has more than 140 over 90, you need to initiate treatment with combined therapy at a fixed dose, but with half the dose. So you need a blocker of calcium channels, for example, six milligrams plus hydrochloracine, and this cannot be administered to pregnant women or women who are expecting to become pregnant. If you have controlled this after a month, you need to maintain this uh, combined therapy. And if you have not reached 140 over 90, you need to increase to full doses. That is to say to move from, from 16 to 32 and maintain the five milligram indupin 
or 12.5 milligram for the other medicine. If after a month you have not been able to control hypertension, then you need to move on to a therapy that adds an, the antagonist calcium at half the dose or the diuretics. If after a month you have not reached 140 over 90, you need to refer to the specialized doctor and all of this together with the recommendations for therapeutic changes. This is the program that is being implemented. And as you have seen in the previous presentations, the results have been good. I thank you for your attention. This is my email. I will be happy to address any questions or any concerns you may have. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Jaramillo, for this excellent presentation. I am asking my colleagues to let me show my camera, my image. I'm asking for the production team to turn on my camera. I don't have video right now, but well, let me continue to talk to you. I would like to take up this opportunity to greet several individuals from various countries that are joining us today. First, I'd like to mention the teams from countries that are implementing hearts, and I have the pleasure to send my greetings to Guyana, Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Chile, Argentina, Ecuador, Mexico, and we also have a country that has been attempting to be part of the Heart Initiative, and that is Guatemala, that is also present here listening to this, and it is a pleasure for us to have the Guatemalan participants here so that you can find out how we are working in other countries and so that you can join us. And we also have colleagues from Bahamas who recently communicated their intention to be part of the Hearts Initiative. I also have some very uh, other very important colleagues from the CDC, and we have our col colleagues from Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente who are led by Jeff Breckler, our advisor for hearts. They are in California, and it is a pleasure to see you all. I would like to remind you, my camera continues to be off. I have it on again, so thank you. I just want to remind you that hearts webinars are recorded. For example, this presentation by Professor Jaramillo is an excellent piece, is, a, is an is excellent material for our schools of nursing and medicine and public health schools and how to present evidence, how a public health program by using evidence is implementing a program with the results that we're seeing now in Trinidad and that we also see in Panama. So without further ado, I invite you to visit Hearts in the Americas webpage. Look for Hearts in the Americas or Hearts in Las Americas, English or Spanish, and you will be able to find plenty of material. The webinar will be recorded there and you will be able to download the material. I understand that we are also receiving broadcasting this on YouTube. And now I ask you all to participate. And now I am going to invite one of the most important practitioners in the area of cardiology, Professor Daniel Pinheiro, who is a professor at the University of Buenos Aires. And in addition to being a president of the Latin America Association of Cardiology, he, is also, he has also been elected to the World Heart Federation as president, and he is one of our champions. And last week, some days ago, rather, 
he was given the prize by the World Hypertension League. I am going to ask you to pay attention to this uh, lecture to be given by Dr. Pinheiro. Without further ado, it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome home. Hi, my name is Gabriel Pinheiro, and I would like to thank first the possibility to be with you here in this event. Over the next couple of minutes, we will be addressing hearts, a clinical platform and a public health platform for all. I do not have any conflict of interest for this presentation. We are going to start with a clinical case. Let's imagine that we have a 63-year-old female with mild overweight, uh, asymptomatic, we, and after several readings, we established 148 over 86 for blood pressure without medication, and we decided to consult the most recent guidelines to properly treat blood pressure. We consulted PubMed and we found that without filter, we have more than 16,000 articles on the treatment of hypertension, more than 1,462 reviews and 53 guides, guidelines. We studied the guidelines offered by the American College of Cardiology, American Heart and the European Association of Cardiology, as well as, as, well as ACP World Heart Federation and also the Ministry of Health of Argentina, since I am from Argentina. In total, we obtained 468 pages to read. The problem is that when we implement treatment, we find that if we continue the American College, American Heart uh, Guidelines, we'd be administering one drug. If we follow the European Association, we would be implementing or administering two drugs. And if we follow ACP, we will not be administering any drugs or treatment. Therefore, there is a high level of contradiction among the various uh, recommendations that we hear from the various, that we receive from the various guidelines. This is quite serious, quite, because uh, hypertension is quite prevalent in men and women. The world prevalence is 43%, 24% in men and 20% in women. That is one every four men and one every five women was more as we see in this article by Martinez and et al. And with Pedro Ordunez, we see a, also a reduction in the rate of premature mortality due to cardiovascular diseases that also risk the objectives of sustainable development. So the authors indicate that the slowdown in the number of improvement of the burden of cardiovascular diseases and also the social inequalities, persistent social inequalities pose important challenges to reduce the burden of cardiovascular diseases and also for the attainment of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Given this problem, we need to find solutions, solutions that take that are taken into account to open up windows of opportunity trying to solve this very great problem that we have at the in health at the global level. We need to find and to take into account the six dimensions, affordability, accessibility, availability, adaptability, and the level of acceptance. And the sixth dimension that is very important that is quality of care. Therefore, we're now going to analyze the main disagreements that we find in the care of hypertension patients. First of all, we have an empirical data, that is to say, evidence-based medicine, molecular medicine, as well as translational medicine and po population-based medicine that is the result of all of these elements. So can we choose any of these models? What we need to do is to interconnect the models to be able to obtain this population-based model with the based quality. Second, 
we have the difference between individual medicine and population-based medicine. We need to harmonize population-based with um, individual-based medicine. We, this happens the same with primary health care and specialized care. These two aspects also need to be harmonized so that we obtain quality primary health care with teams that are that comprise individuals from the different sectors in addition to specialized doctors now we are going to receive to refer to the main disagreements in the area of population based control of hypertension first of all we have reduced or simple forms vis-a-vis -vis broad and complex forms standardized treatment algorithms and protocols which are also simple vis-a-vis multiple and complicated guidelines, fixed drug treatments or just one drug treatment. And then we also have treatment based on figures and also treatment based on risk. First of all, we need to look into short and simple forms as opposed to broad and complex forms. The ideal characteristics of a pharmaceutical treatment for individual hypertension has to take into account the high level of efficacy, the additive and synergetic reduction of pr blood pressure, and it should also be based on clinical trials. It should be tolerable, affordable, available, and also appropriate to be considered regionally. And it should be based on a daily dose and the pills need to be marked so as to allow for the for the division of the dose and also for um, easy titering. Now we have the simple protocols and algorithms vis-a-vis -vis multiple guidelines and complicated guidelines. This is an, algor an algorithm that is not used for hypertension, but if you think that we need to drive our car following a roadmap with so many detours, you, it will, it, we will likely get lost. This is the kind of algorithm we need, a single line, clear, simple. The characteristics of an ideal protocol are to define a specific treatment based on primary care, use the least number of titering steps for the treatment to be linear, linear without any branches, prescriptive, control most cases of high blood pressure, define specific pharmacological drugs in classes and doses, and use half of the maximum dose of the drug at the start of the treatment in order to easily tighter the medication. The step-by-step -step process to transition from the current protocol to a top-ranking protocol needs to give us the tolerance of going through acceptable protocols that improve the current ones despite not being optimum. This will depend on many local circumstances when developing that new protocol. With regards to com fixed combinations of drugs versus monodrugs, the most paradigmatic example is HIV treatment that today is successfully treated with one single tablet. Following this model, we see that combinations with fixed doses are convenient and increase compliance. And they have better effect, fewer collateral or side effects, and lower cost. Let us now talk on treatments based on blood pressure figures. There is evidence that blood pressure treatment, depending on cardiovascular risk, will have an incremental effect. One can see here that at higher risk for the patient, greater is the effect of treating the high blood pressure. However, recent evidence of pharmacological treatment and blood pressure in secondary prevention and even more importantly in primary prevention so that any drop in blood pressure has a positive effect here you can see 
a decrease in events, both in patients with cardiovascular disease and without cardiovascular disease by reducing their blood pressure. As you can see, with the highest reduction of blood pressure, greater is the beneficial effect on the patient's cardiovascular risk. So these two concepts have to be linked. Let us now move on to see our conclusions. First of all, always consider that health, it must be part of all policies. Second, there is a need for action in partnership between governmental organizations, medical societies, med schools of medicine, private sector, patients, civil society, and very importantly, the political decision makers. And let me quote my friend Pedro Ordunez, who said, there's room for everyone. And even more important, everyone is necessary. We need to increase communication, cooperation, in order to become more creative and to have a critical thoughts about actions. With this point of view, and as president-elect of the World Heart Federation, I'd like to tell you that our strategic plan 2021-2023 has as paradigm cardiovascular health for everyone. The World Health organization is carrying out important advocacy work. The World Heart Association is the only one with official representation at WHO. Recently, our president, Ms. Dr. Fausto Pinto, met with Dr. Tedros, the director of WHO, and this is auspicious for the collaboration between the World Heart Association and the World Health Organization. The World Health Association works in many alliances, such as the Global Coalition for Circulatory Health, the NCD Alliance, which is the Non-Communicable Disease Alliance, and more recently, the it, the Pen Plus Partnership. This is a global partnership to provide universal health coverage. Specifically, we have developed roadmaps. These are working documents looking for the barriers to implementation. The roadmaps include the blood pressure roadmap, and currently it is being updated. In our view, initiatives such as HEARTS are fundamental to achieve control and prevention of high blood pressure with standard protocols and medicines, measuring blood pressure using validated equipment through training and education, standardizing data and uh, with innovation in data use through research into implementation and program evaluation. And lastly, with innovation when organizing team-based care and attention. I wanted to share with you this photograph. This is an example of collaboration between an international association such as the Inter-American Cardiology Society and PAHO at a Congress that took place in the Dominican Republic for the Inter-American Society. Was, there was a joint workshop about hearts. This photo obviously is pre-pandemic because you don't see face masks. What is the last point of our goal? Our objective is uh, to provide what works to all those who need it. And let me conclude with this beautiful Titian painting representing Sisyphus. Sisyphus that was written in the fifth century AC where Pindaro says, 
don't seek my soul an immortal life, but exhaust the ambit of what is possible. That's what we want to do, exhaust what is possible so the people inhabiting this planet may live a little bit longer and a little bit better. Let me once again thank you for inviting me to this event. I want to extend my greetings to everyone and hopefully we'll be able to meet in person in the very near future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Daniel Pinheiro. Dr. Jaramillo, thank you also. And now I'm going to ask uh, Drs. Jaramillo and Daniel to switch on their cameras so that we can hear the comments from Dr. Fernando Huiz, the outgoing president of the Cardiology Society. And uh, we did congratulate him after his successful Congress. Hello, Fernando. Good afternoon. Welcome. Such a pleasure to have you join us. We did say that uh, this session was saying that the Inter-American Society supports implementation of hearts in America. I'd like your reaction to this and your reaction to the presentations by Drs. Jaramillo and Piñeiro. So, Fernando Puiz, professor, outgoing president of the Inter-American Society. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you for the invitation. You're in mute. We cannot hear you. No, no. No, I'm not in mute. Yo le estoy activado, eh? No te escucho bien. ¿Me escuchas bien? Daniel, ¿me escuchas? Ah, se le escucho. Ok. Yo te escucho. Ok, entonces. Vale. I want you to thank you, Pedro, for the invitation and greet Daniela and Patricio. It's always a pleasure to see them or be here. A week ago, the General of Medicine published the evaluation of the past 20 years of the National Survey of Health in the United States. And there was an interesting article because it shows that between 2010 to 2010 and then 2010 to 2020, there is a significant drop in control of high blood pressure and diabetes, diabetes in the US, and uh, the control of lipids was un under better control. And where protocols exist, uh, there are no combined therapies and uh, no controls. That bridge in Latin America, that bridge between us, will mean that we won't be able to have figures that are even worse than what we are currently seeing. Recently published by us, by LASH, 42% of Latin Americans have high blood pressure or hypertense. Basically, there is no agreement in managing risk factors in Latin America. And hearts, I believe, is the light, the beacon that should help us speak the same language. We un understand that since we began a few years ago with a standardized program for high blood pressure, we thought about policies. As Daniel pointed out, treatment needs to be affordable with evidence-based medicine, and that would improve the history of the disease. This is a disease that takes 9 million lives a year. That's high blood pressure I'm referring to. And probably with COVID, this is going to increase even further. Daniel pointed out, we are improving the ramp up for the hypertension program in coming months. And that was interesting because we see major differences throughout the world. And not everything is up to date. So people speaking the same language, yes, but not only in Latin America, but throughout the world. Thank you very much, Fernando. It's good that cardiologists, uh, public health teams, Ministry of Health, primary care, that they should get together without any distraction and really put up front what we have. We know what is at stake with hypertension. We know what can be done with hearts working together. Look at the example we heard from Panama, who have been 
working on developing their guidelines and the standardized algor algorithm on hypertension with the cardiologist of Panama. We know that it's happened elsewhere also. But let me go back to Patricio, the first speaker of the second block. Pat Patricio, you who are an authority in the region and in the world actually, saying this is the evidence. So the, my question to you is, could you then tell your colleagues about hypertension, your colleagues in cardiology, could you tell them, really, the technical hearts package is a strong package, it's evidence-based, we have to trust it and support it. Could you do that, Patricio? Thank you very much, Pedro, for that question. Yes, indeed. The best evidence available to us are the results of the hop test. And I say the best evidence because it is a clinical study that included 27% of the 12,500 individuals involved from South America. Therefore, one of the principles we seek in order to implement the study, the results of clinical evidence, is if there is evidence generated in the place where you want to implement it. So what did that study show? Well, first, the beneficial effect to decrease cardiovascular events in individuals in primary prevention, in other words, without any background of this kind of disease, will benefit those that have a blood pressure over 149. So this study with this important Latin American participant shows that the pharmacological treatment for the primary prevention in our region must be given to individuals with more than the blood pressure of over 140. Combined therapy, we use an ADA and a diuretic halfway through the dose. And the results showed that in hypertense patients of well, over 140, over 90, there was a 27% reduction of infarctus, of cardiovascular events and deaths. Another interesting fact, when we add in hypertense patients with over 140 over 90, and I insist on these figures because that is what defines the intervention. When we add half a tablet, in other words, 10 milligram, half of the doses of rosubacystine in these moderate risk patients classified by age, men over 55, women over 60, with a additional Risk factor. In 87%, these were abdominal obesity, in other words, this in greater circumference. By adding 10 milligrams of statins, we had a 40% reduction of. So, primary prevention is possible. The risk of a cardiovascular event recognizes hypertension as the main risk factor in our study with a 27% fraction of the population. Wonderful, Patricio, that was excellent. Yes, yes, go ahead. Let me conclude, Pedro. The recommendation is you have a hypertense patient with more than 140 over 90 and use the standardized treatment plus half the tablet. Which one? Whichever you have available, whichever is existing in where you are. When you have the combination, you can combine any one of the four families of these drugs. Yes, that's wonderful, Patricio, but what does not help people in the primary care is to leave this so open. That is why we have a standardized protocol, because we leave it in the air, we're not going to progress, and that continues with the theory that's been in place for many years, that anyone is good, but that's not right. You need to have the correct doses and the correct um, combination, and that is what is set forth in the protocol so clearly. In our previous webinar, we launched the cardiovascular risk calculator. This calculator has a chapter 
And if you haven't downloaded the calculator, do so now. It has the standardized protocols for all countries. It says which medicine and what dose. And we know this is important because then it ensures that the right drugs are available. The standardized protocols are being developed with the medicines available in each country, but then helping primary care to decide what specific medicine, not an ACE2, not a beta block, but which specifically, what is the dose that I have to administer, as Daniel Pinheiro explained. So let me give the floor now to Daniel. You, the new president of the World Heart Federation, you can see what a fantastic opportunity we're offering you. So in the agenda of your mandate for your working group the, at the World Heart Federation, what uh, attention will be given to hypertension when it comes to primary health care? Well, thank you, Pedro, and as usual, thank you very much for your friendship. It's truly fantastic to see you. And yesterday, I did make a mistake. I thought it was yesterday, this meeting, but it doesn't matter. The paradigm of the World Heart Federation is cardiovascular health for all. When we're saying health, that is the word we're using, health. And cardiovascular health, as we just heard from Patricio, if the risk is 25% for a hypertense patient, that's a tremendous burden, enormous weight. And what do we want to do? The World Heart Federation is brings together all the cardiology societies throughout the world, the foundations throughout the world. And now we're also incorporating groups of patients. What we want to do be is facilitators for the translation of scientific evidence into real health policies. The pandemic actually gives them a wonderful lesson. We may know a lot about the vaccine, if it's mRNA, the spike or whatever. The only vaccine that is good is the one that they actually put it in your arm. If it's not in the arm, it's useless. And the only hypertense drug that uses is the only one that the patient actually takes and brings the, their blood pressure back to normal. So with all the differences that exist between regions, between countries, and even inside a country like mine that is so long and heterogeneous, everywhere, we want to, to be an umbrella telling people knowledge has to be reflected in policy. And then for, we want patients to truly receive the benefits of treatment, which as Patricio mentioned, and as well as Daniel, they are absolutely validated. There are diseases, and I do apologize for going on, but there are diseases, diseases that require a lot more investigation. In our region, it's Chagas. We don't have a vaccine for Chagas. We don't even have a good treatment for Chagas. We need to invest in research. When it comes to hy hypertension, we need to continue with investigation, yes, but we know a lot. The major factor here is implementation and science and implementation i believe need to be the guiding light for the preparation of cardiologists and allow us clinicians work with public health it's not a divorce they have to work hand in hand Thank you very much, Daniel, Patricio, Fernando. So let me close this uh, section. We have one minute to com conclude. Fernando, what would you tell your colleagues in Central America? South America has practically been covered by hearts. We're just missing Uruguay and Venezuela, and with that, we can close Venezuela. But in Central America, we only have Panama. What would you tell your colleagues in Central America who have the intention of supporting implementation of hearts? What would you tell them? 
Thank you, Pedro. This, it's late for this. This should have started many years ago. Since 2019 in the Dominican Republic, it should have been now in all of Central America. Guatemala has good protocols. Everybody's interested, the rest of Central America also. I want to encourage the Guatemalans who are with us today that they rush and hurry up to join hearts. And Central America needs to be in hearts. That's the only way that we're going to overcome and control this disease. Thank you very much, Fernando. Thank the I thank the Inter-American Society for being our partners, our allies, allies in this struggle against hypertension and fighting for cardiovascular health. Now, we do have new countries. They're starting to look at what's happening with some curiosity. Fernando, Daniel, Patricio, do you know that we entered Brazil a month ago? Just over a month ago, we started working with Brazil. Mexico is another large country in the region. We have Argentina, we have Colombia, but new countries are joining us. And we now have Venezuela and Uruguay asking, what do they need to do? That is some of the questions we're seeing in the chat. Then there are some countries that are asking about hearts. So with this partnership with cardiologists, I want to ask Dr. Alejandro Hersinger, who is the president of the Argentine Society, who's listening to this webinar and who is also supporting what we're doing. So let me move to the third section. Thank you very much, Fernando, Patricio, Daniel. Really a pleasure to have had you with us this afternoon. And I hope people will heed your advice and use the materials that you have produced so they use it in their universities, use it as a source of study. Okay, this is science, but it's science plus policy. There are two individuals, they're younger. I don't know if that's the right word, <laughs> but these are two hearts consultants, one located in Chile and the other in Argentina. They will try and help those countries that are not yet involved in hearts, those people who are listening to this for the first time, how treatment can be optimized through the standardized protocol. So let me give the floor to my colleague Andres Rosende, a hearts consultant and part of our team, providing assistance as a clinician in order to move forward with implementation of the protocol. So. Andres Rosende, please go ahead while Eric Zuniga from Chile gets ready. Andres, please. Could we show Andres's presentation? Greetings to the primary health cares of, uh, South, of all of the Americas. Today we're going, going to speak about standardized protocols to optimize treatment. As inhabitants of this planet, we have a commitment towards humanity, and as healthcare workers, that commitment is translated into reducing premature death, and more specifically, premature death due to cardiovascular disease by 30% for 2030. Seeking this objective, the Pan American Health Organization and the World Health Organization have started working on the development of instruments and tools, including the Hearts Initiative that uh, put, put light on diagnosis and control of hypertension, diabetes mellitus, and risk of cardiovascular disease. And why? Why is it focusing on high blood pressure? Because this risk factor is the primary cause of premature cardiovascular death, second cause of acute myocardium infarctus, and also a primary cause of the cerebrovascular of strokes. And it's not limited to these diseases, but it also generates many others, such as chronic kidney uh, insufficiency, dementia, or peripheric vascular disease. In other words, hypertension has a major burden of disease, and it is very frequent in Latin America, affecting over 40% of the adult population. However, we still have a high level of subdiagnosis and treatment amongst those who are aware of their condition is insufficient or deficient. 
So only one out of five hypertense patients actually main, reaches and maintains their blood pressure below 140 over 90. This reality affects equally all Latin American countries. And when we have a hypertense patient, the first thing we think about are um, the recommendations such as uh, changing their lifestyle, such as reduction of salt and sodium, losing weight, exercise. All of this has an impact, no doubt about it, but frequently we forget the importance of pharmacological treatment that not only brings pressure down, but all drugs within all the families, whether diuretics, calcium blockers, uh, in inhibitors of the enzyme, they all result in a more or less equivalent reduction of a systolic blood pressure, which is about nine millimeters of mercury at the mid dose. This reduction is not only in the values of blood pressure, but it translates in an important decrease in of the risk of serious events such as infarct, stroke, uh, cardiac insufficiency, and even premature mortality. The key points in all of this is that high blood pressure is one of the leading causes of uh, premature death and uh, disease. The prevalence is very high in Latin America. It's not an exception. The treatment of these patients is effective and safe, and the diagnosis of control and high blood pressure in Latin America are deficient. So we have challenges having to do with improving pressure ensuring good, good adherence by patients with simple therapeutic schemes, decrease the inappropriate variability of clinical practice, utilizing a specific group of drugs known to be effective and are easy to administer, improve access to these medicines by the population and overcome therapeutic inertia, overcome that resistance that we as workers in the health sector have to increase intensified treatment when what we're observing in the physical examination of the patient recommends that. Fundamentally, to standardize is the answer, and this is the HEARTS proposal. HEARTS has developed the ideal conditions for, treat, for a protocol for a standardized treatment that must clearly define a course of action without any doubts. It must be thought out for the primary health care where most hypertense patients go, use the fewest step as possible in therapeutic ramping up, have a linear structure without any branches to be applicable to most hypertense patients, in other words, being all encompassing, and to find specific drugs and their doses and fundamentally promote the use of combination of drugs at fixed doses at an early point. Why? Well, because these new nine millimeters of mercury on the systolic pressure generated by any uh, drug in an average dose can become 11 millimeters of mercury. That's a 20% with a double dose. And this is the most usual behavior of the providers if a patient doesn't reach the light level. So if I combine that uh, medicine with another one from a different family of hypertensive medicine or at medium or low levels, I am going to have additive result. That is to say, we are going to duplicate the power with a better safety profile because we are using lower doses in combination. Therefore, the impact of adverse uh, events is significantly reduced. What is the situation in Latin America? Two thirds of the hypertensive patients, they are being administered monotherapy. And this is for patients between 60 and 70%. This is for 60 to 70% of patients and most of them are receiving just one drug. And this is a protocol that would be complying with hearts after diagnosing hypertension, we need to start with only 
one combined pill that is administered once a day. We also need to ask the patient to come back to the clinic after a month. And if the measures are not attained, we can start with half a pill and then move on to one pill. That is to say, we'd be doubling the dose. And if after a month there is no control, we can double. But at this point in time, most of the patients have attained control at the first level of care. What do we do with 15 to 20 percent of patients who are resistant to treat treatment? We need to refer them to the second level of treatment. And what happens with changes to lifestyle? They need to be maintained throughout the treatment regime. This is not something to be done at the outset and to be abandoned later on to go back to pharmacological treatment, and it is not one or the other. We cannot have patients that just have lifestyle changes, and we cannot just have lifestyle changes forgotten in patients that are being treated with uh, medicines. So once we control hypertension, we can still offer greater benefit if we focus on the risk. And we need to understand how all of the risk factors interact in a patient and how they become even stronger. How do we estimate the cardiovascular risk? We need to establish various therapeutical regimes, who should be receiving aspirin, who should be receiving statins, and also to define the need for more intensive control goals to schedule the frequency of the visits to the health centers, also to assess the need to have a consultation or referral to other specialized uh, doctor, and also for the sake of efficient treatment. Statins are very safe drugs to lower cholesterol, and also by means of this decrease, we have a positive impact on the reduction of, uh, um, of uh, heart disease and also uh, other and, and stroke. So aspirin has also been important as a preventive measure for heart disease and also stroke. There is a significant decrease of the risk. And as to primary care, we start to balance this against the increase we may see in the risk, for example, of digestive or stomach bleeding. Therefore, the clinical benefit is tighter. And this is not recommended. It may be reserved for the population that is at higher risk. And this is quite similar to those who have already had a cardiovascular event in the past. What is the proposal to estimate the cardiovascular risk? Just one question, whether the problem has any history of cardiovascular disease, that is to say whether the person has had an infarction, stroke, or any of these diseases, then the patient is of high risk and we are selecting the population that will benefit the most with the administration of statin and aspirin. If the patient does not have this background, we need to look into diabetic possibilities and also uh, tobacco consumption, weight, and also use an automatic device to measure blood pressure, use the table that has been designed for our country and estimate the patient risk. What is Hart's suggestion? The same, to start with the same question, select the highest risk population, the population of secondary prevention, but then we have innovation. Then we have the reason for Hart, that is to say, go back to the simple methods and that's why we have a fundamental key that is the risk calculator whereby with this application that we use on our smartphones or on desktop computers we can input these variables regardless of the fact that we have the cholesterol level or not so this is highly applicable to healthcare centers that do not have these resources and then we are going to rapidly estimate the heart disease risk, and we can also use it as a tool to teach the patient what impact there would be with a change in these variables. Here we have a 13% risk at 10 years, which is high. And what would happen if the person has lower cholesterol, stops smoking, and we improve the blood pressure, we see that the risk is reduced by half. And this is an incredibly 
important measure for the health workers so that the patient makes the decision to adopt healthy lifestyle. In addition to this, the heart calculator also provides us with the health protocol approved in the various countries for the treatment of blood pressure. And we see both tools within reach for us to benefit our patients. It is key for us to understand that the management of heart risk will allow us to be more efficient in the use of resources and have a higher impact with our interventions. As a conclusion, most of hypertensive patients will need drug therapy, combined drug therapy to attain proper control of the blood pressure, also to establish standardized protocols and also with simplified regimes to improve observance and also to diminish the therapeutical inertia to focus on healthcare to allow for better prevention and also to more efficiently use the resources. And I conclude with Hart's message, do whatever is simple, make it simple turn it simple. Thank you very much, Andres. Your presentation is excellent. The capacity to convey what we are currently doing here at Hearts. Let's see if we, your camera is on, please continue. Well, very well. So let's see if we can communicate. I was saying, Andres, that your presentation is excellent. I think that we have already made some progress with this calculator because this is uh, this becomes a practical method in particular for everyone at the first level of care. Everyone will have a way to measure blood pressure, what the requirements are, what the characteristics are, the protocol and also how the heart risk is assessed using the calculator and also the risk tables by WHO that have already been updated and how we implement treatment. But we also heard about the importance of teamwork and this is the reason why we have another colleague here, one of our heart consultant who is Eric Zuniga, who is in Antofagasta and who is the leader of the program there. And Eric Zuniga, Dr. Erika, Eric Zuniga, who is a heart consultant from Chile, will be explaining us why the team-based care is appropriate and what the new rules of the game are. So that is to say, teams work and the new rules of the game. Eric, please go ahead. And after Eric, we are going to have Fernando Lanas, who is who will be commenting on both presentations. Eric Zuniga, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Welcome to this session where we will share some concepts of the team-based work. This uh, session is called team-based uh, work and the new rules of the game, team-based care. The first comment is the World Health Organization has established a parameter of 25 healthcare workers every 10,000 inhabitants as a minimum human resource requirement to cover for all of the essential public health interventions. And here to the right, we can see the different reality that we have with the countries of the Americas. And this is a situation that we also see in the other countries of the world. Therefore, we should first recall that in many places, we're going to have an insufficient number of health workers. And if what we are trying to attain is to reduce partly the burden, the workload of these uh, individuals and to maintain efficient continuous care, we need to work with uh, multidisciplinary teams. And clearly the problem is that we need to include primary health care doctors, technicians, patients, and family members. The first comment 
is that team-based work is the reallocation of clinical tasks and non-clinical tasks from one level to the next, from one level to the next so that care can be provided more efficiently. And next, all of the team members have a role in patient care. Therefore, responsibilities are shared for better care. Then team-based work also has some advantages. Clearly, the first one we find is that there is a broadening of access to health services with better support for the patient and clearly with better collaboration among the members of the team. This leads to better observance of the pharmacological treatment and we can also provide better follow-up for our patients and also improve hypertension control. In addition to this, the patient also is better informed about his or her own pathology, and this allows for better life quality and satisfaction in terms of the patient and the doctor. Team-based work is key for hypertension control, but it is not the only element. And even though this team-based work is at the heart of effective hypertension control, there are other four elements that are absolutely important and that are necessary. The first one is to have a simple practical protocol for the treatment of hypertension. We need to have equipment and reliable medicine, drugs, and also to focus on the patient and have monitoring and recording methods to see how we are developing our task. The implementation of our team-based approach has to be developed and adopted by each country based on their local capacity, their experience, their availability, and access to resources. And here, this is where we need to determine and screen some of the barriers that we may identify. First, we have the legislation and public policies. And next, we have two aspects that are completely important and that are very close to primary care. That is the high turnover of staff and also the difficulty to retain already trained personnel. But we also have two factors that have to do with the patient's attitude. Oftentimes, he or she wants only to be seen by doctors, but also the doctor who oftentimes is not very open to sharing some of his or her tasks. Team-based work is also reliant on health regulations as to what the health staff can and cannot do. We do need the support of the health authorities, and here we need to establish a difference among established, between establishing and implementing ideas. We need to go beyond supporting team-based work, but we also need to provide them with the conditions, with the tools, with the regulations for this to be implemented and for our patients to benefit at the level of primary health care. The implementation of team-based work should involve all of the health team doctors, non-doctors, um, technicians, uh, family members, but it has to be gradual. We also need to acknowledge that we need to provide steps for implementation. We need to include all of the team. We need to determine the composition of our team. And with that, we need to develop a flow chart and communicate to th with the rest of the team and the staff. Clearly, we need to talk to the patients, to the family members with a gradual approach so that we can have uh, the best model. And once we implement this, we need to assess the progress made. The team-based work requires solid basis and also training on new skills and a redefinition of the roles as well as the supervision, the advisory, and also the permanent support of the members that have the most experience. And once we have established those bases, we can move on to the next stage. And this has to do with clean, the meeting meetings among clinical teams to facilitate dialogue among the members of the teams and all of these geared towards improving the quality of our services and also designing or redesigning our processes and clearly measuring our results. 
the final goal is not to improve the only control of blood pressure, but also to reduce cardiovascular risk among our patients. And as, the, as has been seen in hope for, in by using a reduction of hypertension and also by reducing lipids and also by focusing on the work of non-medical practitioners and also the work of the families and the delivery of drugs, we were able to significantly reduce blood pressure and also to reduce the risk among this population. Therefore, and to conclude, we should say that the care of hypertensive patients is a responsibility of all of the healthcare team in which all of the members has a role and has a task to comply with for better treatment and reduction of the cardiovascular risk among our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Eric Zuniga from Antofagasta. We have Eric Zuniga from Antofagasta and we have Fernando Lana from the other end. So now we have the closing of this event with our Chilean colleagues. And first of all, I would like to thank Professor Fernando Lana, who has been our advisor for a very long time. <coughs> and I would like for him to react. Uh, Mr. Lana, is it true that team-based work makes a difference in the successful handling of programs for the control and prevention of cardiovascular disease and hypertension. Dr. Lanas, please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you, Pedro. I think that all of this seminar has been extraordinarily interesting. All of the lectures, first level, in, high quality lectures, it has been very exciting. When we saw the studies showing that only one out of five individuals in Latin America had controlled blood pressure, it was very surprising and sad as a piece of news because we know that it is the first cause of death that can be corrected. It is easy to diagnose as compared to other problems, other conditions, you just need to have a blood pressure monitor. And we also know that treatment reduces events and there are medicines, drugs available that are costly. And I think that the control of uh, hypertension can be considered a failure of medicine because of the in in existence of these two elements that Eric mentioned and Andres mentioned, I was thinking of hypertension. I studied medicine more than 40 years ago. And when I was studying, there was a very simple standardized treatment with pre-established uh, doses and and the same happened with TB in many countries that has been reduced by 90% as compared to what we see with hypertension that continues to be poorly controlled. So I do think that standardized uh, measurements are very good and also the global approach to risk if you measure, if you look at the measure and look at the result of HOPE 3 and HOPE 4, most of the success comes from the approach and the centering on various risk factors. And as to what Eric said, as from the medical associations, if we would like to work in teams for blood pressure control, we need to make an effort to talk to the authorities to discuss this with the authorities because clearly the individual heart doctors will not be creating 
these um, teams. We need to work with uh, uh, those who make decisions at the level of the ministries or the authorities. This is the comment I wanted to make. Excellent, excellent, Fernando. And now coming from an authority like you, our comments are more credible and it is also a way for our colleagues in the area of cardiology and hypertension for everyone to work together in avoiding distractions and trying to find where to make uh, progress. That traditional method that you mentioned has not worked for the control of hypertension. And what is the definition of craziness? Craziness is doing the same thing every day and wait for a different result. So how is it possible that having all of the therapeutical treatments that we have, all of the scientific knowledge we had, we have, that's the reason why it was so important to listen to Daniel Jaramillo and also to listen to Fernando saying, Fernando was saying, let us work together now. Primary health care can make a difference by making a substantive contribution to better health indicators. But I also wanted to tell you again that you need to visit Hart's web pages. There are several resources. We also have virtual courses of uh, very good quality that have been produced by the Inter-American Cardiology Association. One of them, the most famous one, is on the management of secondary prevention, which is which has more than 50,000 50, students. Go there, look at the cardiovascular risk uh, calculator that we hadn't seen in many places because many people do not know that it exists. And this is another tool that, in my opinion, is quite sensitive and that you can use there. So we have an updated course on the management of hypertension, and there are several resources that go from science, and this goes through the training of primary health care workers and also synergies among the various cardiology teams and the various heart associations who have committed to make progress in that direction. So to conclude this webinar, we have some questions and first of all, I'd like to send my greetings to our colleagues who are working from the various countries. We are about to conclude this webinar. I ask you to turn on the cameras and take the family picture as we do it usually with all of the experts participating here. Elsa Arenas, Rohi Dung, please turn on your cameras. Fernando Wiz, Daniel Pinheiro, Patricio Lopez Jaramillo, Eri Zúñiga, Andres Rosente, Fernando Lanas, who have shared this session with us today. I would like to send my greetings to Guillermo and Ms. Ingrid in Colombia, Miguel in Mexico, as well as Maria Cristina Escobar in Chile, Mirta Villacre in Ecuador, Olivia and Stephanie in the Dominican Republic. I would like to take up this opportunity also to thank our hearts team at headquarters in our production team, the company that works with us that is in charge of production. But I'd like to ask you all upon conclusion, we start uploading the material and the video that we recorded. And it is important for individuals to have this on their own computers. We also have an open YouTube channel for this conference where people are receiving this communication and so that the teams, the primary healthcare teams can have it. So I wanted to ask Andres, for new primary health care teams in the countries and the new participants, how can they have access to the new treatment protocols? Please go ahead. Thank you, Pedro. Greetings to all of our friends and colleagues with the Hearts Initiative and the American Heart Association. Hearts webpage, as we saw recently, 
has all of the instruments and tools for all of the countries that are interested in these protocols. We have the standardized protocols and we also have resources to guide the countries that would like to be part of this initiative so that they can also design their own protocols, standardized protocols based on their own reality. And we're also here willing to support you from PAHO and we invite you to be part of this great team. Very well. Thank you, Eric. What do you have to say? You are an example of putting the team together. You had your health center in Antofagasta. You had the work of doctors, nurses. What do you have to say to the doctors, for example, who are sometimes um, not willing to participate? How do we get the nurses, the doctors to participate? not necessarily doctors, but beyond doctors. What is your opinion, Eric? Thank you. I think it is feasible. The experience we have in Chile and in other countries that have been implementing HEART have shown that this is possible locally, as you indicated. We need to share the tasks with the patient that is um, that has hypertension, the patient that is part of this hydrovascular, uh, that has a cardiovascular disease. I think that we can continue to make progress. There are several tasks that are focused too much on drugs and we need to work with technicians, with community health workers, so that we can obtain some help in this context nowadays whereby the in-person controls of these individuals have also decreased drastically. So I think that we need to assess the number of tasks that we need to develop with the patient as part of the cardiovascular health care program, who can implement them, how we can train other individuals to take care of them so that we can increase the level of care and increase the coverage and decrease the problem with cardiovascular diseases very well. I think that we are left with a very good feeling after this excellent presentation, as you have observed. I think that it is very important to spread the rumor and to share the material. We will be using this in the next webinars, and I can tell you that the upcoming webinars, and I, am, I usually say what the next one is, but I am going to say what the next topics will be. At least we are going to see each other once a month. First, we will be discussing two very large trials that have been published with the, in coordination with the Oxford University. One of these is in Mexico, the other one from Cuba, that have recently published this information, and they are planning a webinar that is devoted to these uh, cohorts from Cuba and Mexico, and also the implementation of hearts in Cuba and Mexico. We will be announcing the new WHO hypertension guidelines. They will be published in the near future. And uh, we were very well represented at that committee developing these guidelines. And then we'll see what kind of recommendations are shared with us. But let me tell you in advance that we need to prepare the most important aspects for implementation, how we can turn science into specific actions at the primary health care. Those are the WHO guidelines. We will also be working with a team called Innovation in Heart Care. This uh, was uh, has generated instruments to facilitate improvement based on rigorous evidence, improvement in managing hypertension and using measurement equipment spearheaded by Dr. Jeff Bressler. And they are also organizing a virtual course and it will be on the heart platform in the near future. We also will launch the new indices of prevalence, knowledge, and control of hypertension globally. And I know a lot about it, but I'm not going to tell you right now. I want to keep you interested so that you join us. 
Fernando, let me tell you that the control level is not 20 percent. But don't believe we're that good. It's going to be better than 20. But uh, still not good enough based on what can be done. So there will be seeing the performance of each country. It, the new estimates will be published by then, and our data team will also present its new instrument for data collection at the primary healthcare centers. So, as you see, we have lots of good webinars in the pipeline. We also have the hypertension roadmap. This will be published in the, very shortly. That will be yet another way to get all get us all together and to really focus our attention on taking care of hypertension. I thank all the participants. If you want photographs, now now is the moment. Gloria, Jorge, Elsa, our team, whenever you are, Sonia. But we're not allowed to, uh, to uh, switch on our cameras. We're prevented from doing it. It's been blocked. But maybe Patricio can open it now. Well, let's have a large picture of uh, Patricio, 40 by 40. No, not mine. I don't want a picture of myself. I want a picture of all of you. Audios are not, videos are no longer blocked. You should be able to enable your videos now. Yes, we can see Patricio. There are over 200 people connected right now. And actually, we would have liked to have even more participants, but uh, some there was some kind of problem. I don't know if people have are to have taken their summer leave or if it's too hot. I don't know what the problem is. But let me thank each and every one of you for your support and your leadership. And let us continue with hearts. And everybody joins this effort. So we'll see you at the next webinar. We wish you to an enjoyable rest of the day. Let us not forget that COVID is serious. Many people are dying. We haven't won the battle and we must continue. So very best wishes for a good rest of the day. I'm grateful to the interpreters and the administrative team that is supporting us behind the scene. Sonia, Gilka, Jenny, she's not here with us right now, but uh, she's always with us, or usually anyway. So goodbye. Goodbye to you all. Goodbye. Take a photograph, Sonia or Gloria, whoever. How can I take a photograph? All of us cardiologists here meeting together with healthcare professionals. Yes, we've taken the pictures, don't worry. So put in, you're always smiling, that's good. Enable your audio, your video, I'm sorry. We have new members in the team working with data. Get ready, because we're going to have to have a webinar on that also. We want to show you that package as well. Goodbye, everyone. Hello. 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 Hello.